My name is John Wong. I am director of the Montgomery Scholars Program. And again, thank you for coming here today to learn about the program. Okay, so what is the Montgomery Scholars Program? Uh, I'm here to give you a quick overview. You have the agenda, of course, in the handout. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview, and you also hear from our students, alum, our counselor, uh, kind of get a full sense of the program. Um, and of course, we'll answer any questions you may have uh, at the end. So what, what is the program? We are interdisciplinary scholars program, and we provide a two-year merit scholarship to our students. So um, it is a selective process. Unlike the general Montgomery College admissions, we select 25 students per year for our programs. Uh, these are generally high-achieving students who are looking to continue their academic uh, progress and achievement in an honors program. And we expect, generally, our students to go on to transfer to a four-year college or university. So it's a two-year merit scholarship. Um, we cover 30 hours uh, of study um, per year. So it's a full load uh, per year. And uh, it is a merit scholarship, so it does not depend on your uh, economic status or your income. It, if you get in, you get that scholarship, no matter who you are. Um, so there's that. We offer, in particular, a cohort experience. What that means is this is a program that's specifically designed to have the students come in together and go through the program together. It is not like a typical college environment where you show up to campus and you sign up for different classes and then you just go to those classes on your own. What we did was we um, curated a very set course, uh, set um, number of classes, and our students come in through these honors, pro honors classes together. The idea is to build a community, build um, support through having this close-knit experience. Um, so that's what the cohort experience means. And we also teach our classes through learning communities. These are, these are technical terms, so I'm going to try to get through, kind of give you an idea of what that means. So typically, when you go to a college or university, um, you know, whatever your major is, they'll ask you to fulfill certain requirements, like an arts distribution, social science distribution, um, humanities distribution, and you just go ahead and you know pick out the classes you want from those distributions, and then you fulfill those requirements okay, on your own. And the idea is it gives you a well-rounded background, taking these classes from different fields, and then on your own you make connections. Uh, I learned something from this class, or something from that class, and then you kind of fill in your experience accordingly. What we did was we designed a special curriculum for our students where we take these requirements, these distributions, and we built a curriculum around them with our own classes that are taught together. So you take a literature class, a history class, a world music class, anthropology class. Yes, but they're not on their own. They are taught by our faculty together. Okay? They work on the curriculum together. They work on the syllabi together. They work on the lessons together. So everything's integrated into a full, complete learning experience. <laughs> It's a very unique um, offering, uh, and again, specific for our students. This is something that only our students get to participate in, and not other Montgomery College students. So we offer um, our core curriculum, a learning community, which help build the cohort experience. And what you end up with is a two-year curriculum in which the students come out of it with 24 to 27 honors credits, depending on uh, whether you have to take an English 1-2 class or not. And what that does is when you transfer, when you apply for a transfer um, college, when you apply to transfer to college or university, they look at your transcript here and they see all these honors courses on there. When you compare it to other students who are also transferred to these, student, uh, to these institutions, our students have that edge then of having completed an honors curriculum and demonstrated their ability and makes them more appealing to these universities. Frequently, our students end up in uh, schools with partial or full scholarships as a result because they were able to demonstrate this merit, this academic scholarship. Uh, so our curriculum, as I mentioned, um, is based on the learning community experience uh, with cohorts, and we have, as a result, also a dedicated faculty. We have carefully hand-selected faculty who work with these students, and the faculty work, we work together to support the students, um, to build our uh, syllabi and curriculum together. So these are faculty that are, that are specifically assigned to work with this program. 
Along with that, we have dedicated counselors. We have counselors who are used to working with scholar students who are assigned to our students specifically to help them through these courses, to help them gain transfer scholarships, to help them figure out where they want to go next, all that stuff. As part of this program, uh, we have a very uh, student-friendly student-to-faculty ratio. Typically, if you go off to a four-year school, you know, I myself sat in lecture halls with like 300 of the students, maybe more. <laughs> it was really easy to get lost. If you go off to Maryland right away, you end up, you know, in the first two years, oftentimes in a classroom with 300 students. So what we offer, not only is it a smaller um, class size, we have a five-to-one faculty ratio where it's a very intimate experience between faculty and students. Uh, what that also means is a stronger relationship, uh, more support for the students, and when it comes time to write letters of recommendation, these faculty know your students better than anybody else. And they'll be able to write the strongest letters of recommendation. Uh, I myself am still writing letters for students who just graduated and they're now applying to do other things after they transfer. So that kind of gives you a quick overview of the program. <laughs> High impact activities. So uh, the Scholars Program, is, again, it's an interdisciplinary program where we kind of we, we look at education as a holistic experience. It's not just what happens in the classroom. Uh, so in addition to our honors curriculum, we also provide a number of activities uh, that are designed to um, provide a high impact educational experience for our students. So they include, for example, uh, round tables where we invite guest speakers to come do presentations. Uh, in the past, we've had a two-time Grammy Award winner uh, come do a talk on uh, music of the Great Depression. Uh, more recently, we had um, another musician come uh, to perform for the students. Uh, we've had a museum curator come to talk about some some aspects of art. Uh, we've had uh, one of our alum. He normally comes every year. Uh, he's currently a chef, or he's an instructor at a culinary academy, and he'll perform um, a culinary experience with the students and talk about some aspect of culinary arts. Okay, so there's, there's a wide range of activities <laughs> that we provide. Again, this is specific to our students in the Montgomery Scholars Program where we try to round out the educational experience. So the round tables, uh, we also hold Philo Cafes, what we call Philo Cafes. Um, those are uh, an opportunity for our first year students to come together and basically bond over uh, a shared experience. So we gather them together, there's food, there are beverages, and we have them um, basically ask questions and just we try to answer them best as we can. Uh, it's an opportunity for them to share ideas, talk with each other, build more connections, uh, and also get to know the faculty better uh, in a very casual, informal setting. As part of our first year curriculum, we also provide curated visits to museums down at the National Mall. Uh, we typically take them to the Library of Congress, and we've visited a number of different museums down there, such as the African American Museum, various <laughs> ones that also tie into the classroom experience. Our students also get uh, updates on internship opportunities available to them. We send out information about uh, upcoming transfer opportunities, scholarship opportunities, and internship opportunities. And many of our students participate in prestigious internships. Uh, a number of them have gone on to do the Johns Hopkins Collaboratory over the summer, uh, as well as uh, internships at NIST. So that, that's something, again, uh, our students kind of have, uh, there's like a pipeline <laughs> that is given to our students where they, they see all these opportunities and they're able to take advantage of them uh, more ready. Between the first and second years, we bring our students on a summer study travel seminar. So over the course of 10 days, uh, we take our students, and then this is pending, I always have to say this pending uh, operational status and budget, but outside of COVID, we have always done it every year. Um, where we take our students, and for the past, I think, 10 years, we brought them down to the Swannanoa Gathering in North Carolina at Warren Wilson College, where uh, they participate in this music festival, where they take classes on music, 
they participate in these workshops, um, get to hear lots of concerts, maybe play some music themselves. Uh, and they also get a chance to get a sense of the dorm experience. You go down to Carolina, North Carolina with the rest of your classmates. Um, you also visit a couple of other places along the way, such as the Biltmore Estate, Thomas Wolfe House, uh, and just kind of get to know each other on this road trip. And it is a honors travel seminar, so they're also tasked with writing about the experience along. And it is, it is uh, a highlight of the program. Our, our students find it uh, an invaluable experience. Uh, they come back, like, they come back and they just feel like they've grown, <laughs> like in the next couple of years within a week. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's our summer study travel program. Last thing on here is the Beacon Conference. So as part of the scholarship aspect of our program, uh, every student in the second year is, at, is tasked with creating a capstone project and they are to submit it to the Beacon Conference, which is a um, academic conference for honor students on the East Coast, on the Atlantic Coast. So our students present their research uh, and if selected, or that they submit the research and selected, they will then get to present at BK. Right? And BK conference is a conference that's held at different cities each year. So if selected, they then go on road trip again uh, to whichever school is being held and they present their research at the conference. It's a great honors uh, opportunity, a great scholarship opportunity. And again, it's something else that further uh, distinguishes our students from different applicants when they're looking to transfer on to different schools. Here's just uh, some photos to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that go on in the program. Uh, we have in the upper right corner, uh, two-time Grammy Award winner, Kathy Fish, who came to one of our round tables, uh, musician Nista uh, who came recently to do another performance. Uh, we have uh, no. down here is uh, our opening welcome to our first year students in the first week we bring in our students um, for a series of orientations. We also give them uh, a one-day retreat, off-campus retreat, an opportunity for them to get to know one another. Uh, so we participate in games and team-building activities. And right then, you kind of just see these students get into the flow and, and start forming bonds with each other. Um, we have a student at one of the museum visits we took to, and also uh, some students when we had Mariano, who uh, is the chef, and he came and did a performance with culinary arts, and people got to eat the result. I think that was a presentation for um, Beacon. <laughs> okay. Our students tend to do very well, uh, and they transfer out to various schools, um, certainly around the state, but also uh, around the rest of the country. This is just a, a partial list of the various schools our students have transferred on to. Um, this past May, the graduating class of 2022, uh, one of my students, one of our students went on to Yale uh, after having received scholarship offers from other schools as well. Uh, another student went on to Johns Hopkins. Uh, many, maybe even most students go on to Maryland uh, College Park, often with partial or full scholarships. So it, it's, it's something where we're very proud of. We are an interdisciplinary program, and that is to say our program provides a foundation you can use to pursue careers in just about any field. Our classes are built around the, fun the general education requirements uh, that you have to fulfill. And so this is something that, you know, these are requirements that you would have to fulfill regardless of whatever program you have to go on to. So our students go on to pursue careers in any number of fields. Um, if you look at our alumni, they are teachers, computer coders, doctors, artists, uh, researchers, all kinds of people. And here, again, just a partial list <laughs> of the very fields our alumni have gone on to work in. Um, for our first year students, we're having an alumni panel do a presentation this Thursday. And for this year's panel, we have somebody who's running a dance studio, a pharmacist, a dental hygienist, a computer game designer, uh, a legislative researcher. So it really spans like the whole, the whole spectrum. Great. 
I'll talk a little bit about the curriculum in terms of what what the students have to go through, uh, what they go through as uh, scholars. So this is our curriculum. In the first year, they take five classes, four of which, the first four, are part of that learning community I talked about. So anthropology, world history, world literature, and world music, those are all integrated into one course where everything is taught together. Right? And on top of that, there's the English component, first year composition. And then there will be also the opportunity to take you know, various electives or whatever other classes you're a uh, student would like to take uh, towards their field. So the, the bulk of our coursework is concentrated in the first year. And then in the summer, there's the travel seminar. And in the second year, there's another learning community that's integrated um, between an international relations class and our capstone project class. So those two are a learning community. They're combined and taught together. Um, so the bulk of the coursework is in the first year. The second year essentially is an opportunity for them to build a capstone project and then use the rest of the time to take all the courses they need to fulfill their major requirements. And I think that's it for the, the general overview and the curriculum. Um, but beyond that, I would like you to hear from our students, okay, who may give you a, a more relatable idea of what it's like to be in this program. So at this point, I would like to um, ask David Berger, our first year student, to come up and give you a little idea of what it's like for him to be a Montgomery scholar. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am David Berger. So I will just give my perspective so far. Um, I remember being in your shoes last year, doing the college application process. Um, very stressful, but very exciting time. Um, you're deciding the next path in your life, where you're going to go. Um, and I just think that Montgomery Scholars, you know, I didn't initially know where I wanted to go, but when I ended up in Montgomery Scholars, I realized it really was the place for me. Um, you know, I, I'm a very humanities-based student, and I realized maybe not all of you are, um, but even if you are STEM-focused, more of like the mathematical person, the concepts that you learn in this program, the things that you take with you along with you in this program, whether it be study habits or just what you learn from courses like anthropology or history or music, they go along with you in your life. You can carry them with you wherever you go. Um, and that's one of the biggest things for me to take away from even just my first few months in the program so far. Um, in high school, I struggled a little bit, you know, with time management or skills like that. Um, but then when I got to scholars, I realized that, you know, I really had to apply myself and I was in charge of my success. And I had a whole league of other students who love learning just like me, who are in the same learning community as me. I mean, we're taking, you know, the same classes and we have these, this experience that we're together. Um, you know, they're all behind me, really supporting me throughout this. Um, so in addition to me and others developing all of our study habits um, through this program, we also have, you know, faculty, we have our advisors, we have our professors who are there for us. You know, we go to their office hours and they aid us with that. So there is no feeling of like you're on your own that sometimes college can bring. There's a lot of... Um, I have many friends who feel kind of, who may feel like a little bit lost or alone, not here, but, you know, in four-year institutions as well. Um, but I, I, I like to kind of brag about the scholars program because it's such a, an amazing experience, even outside of the classroom. Um, we went to, it was a museum of Asian art because we were learning about those concepts in our, you know, in our music class and our history class. Um, you know, we got to explore calligraphy, you know, uh, like, um, and like Islamic proverbs and things like that. We got to look at statues. We got to look at like architecture, Korean architecture. It was so engaging and so interesting. And the professors really, they encourage you to engage with, um, with 
the substance with the material um, outside of the lecture as well. And you have this whole community with you where, you know, we, we have a group chat and we talk about, you know, we talk about some of the things, some of the concepts that we've learned like in our courses and we apply them and it's, it, it's really, really fun and it's really, really engaging. And that's something I've taken away from my first year experience. I've just grown so far and I'm continuing to grow. Um, I've made so many amazing friends going into college. I was a little bit worried about making friends and things like that, you know. Um, but even from like the first retreat when we went up to Boy to the little Seneca Lodge, I mean, that was, I made so many friends just there. And I realized so many people like, um, so many opportunities to grow and learn. And that's really, I think, the core of it. There's so many more opportunities I'm going to be able to take, which your second year, the second year students will uh, speak to you about going forward. Um, and I'm just very excited based off of that album. Um, and yeah, that is pretty much um, my first year experience so far. Um, I encourage you all to look into Montgomery Scholars and definitely consider it. Um, it's been very beautiful. And thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to speak with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Dr. Wang already did a... You, you stole on my thunder, man. You just like... Describe the describe this the the summer study travel seminar. It's uh, very very adequately. Uh, but I'll I'll just kind of recap again. My name is Professor Victor Provost. I am one of the core instructors. I teach the world music course, um, and I also am one of the faculty members that will be accompanying you on our our summer summer study travel seminar. This is a picture of our second years, so this past summer, in front of the Biltmore Estate, behaving like billionaires. So, um, our summer study, summer travel, whatever the whole name of it is, summer study travel seminar, um, is part of our, part of our, our honors curriculum. Um, we spent 10 days on the campus of Warren Wilson College in Swannanoa, North Carolina, which is about 10, 12 minutes outside of downtown Asheville. Um, it's an incredibly beautiful place. Uh, you're in the Blue Ridge Mountains. You'll see some, some awesome pictures. And students get to engage in a number of learning activities. Probably the, the, the primary focus is the, the studies of either music, literature, at the Swannanoa gathering. So this year we were there as part of Celtic week, which means our students were taking instrumental lessons in penny whistle, fiddle and violin and singing traditional songs. Um, but they were also for anybody who is music averse, like my mom, oh, love you mom. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, there, were there were lots of other courses that, that you could engage Right. So, for example, I took a course with, uh, I took a course on I co called Masterclass in in Performance, uh, Masterclass in Artistry. There were classes on uh, Gaelic literature, and you get to to engage with these high high level professionals uh, in a very close quarters. Uh, aside from that, you can see we we take some some fun trips. So this was our <laughs> that's. Professor uh, Dr. Swift Dickinson, uh, who's uh, one of the other faculty that accompany us, uh, traversing a river in Cherokee country, North Carolina. So we visit the, we start our visit with the, with, with the Frontier Museum, which is a, a stop in Stockton, Virginia, that has these different, uh, these different frontier experiences. So they have an Irish farm and a German farm, and an American farm, and also a West African Igbo village. And then we make our we kind of continue down to Swannanoa, check in at Warren Wilson College, and you're assigned your dorm rooms. 
uh, like Professor Wang, Dr. Wang said, it's a, a kind of a live live on campus experience, which is like super valuable for students at uh, at the Scholars Program because you get to get to, to feel what it what it is to, to live off campus or to live on campus, I suppose. Uh, some of our, our second years said things like, "This is the first time I've had to do my own laundry." wash my own dishes. <laughs> you grow up really quickly. Um, but they also spent a lot of time, quality time together outside of the classroom. A few of them became ping pong experts. There was a lot of card games, <laughs> a lot of card games, a lot of uh, uh, 10 or 12 people huddled around a very small computer screen to watch a movie together because there's no TVs, um, no video games, none of that. And uh, and so, yeah, so we, we hang out together at Swananoa. They take these amazing classes. We we head down into Asheville, North Carolina, uh, kind of downtown Asheville, where we visit the the home of Thomas Wolfe, Thomas Wolfe House Museum, um, of course, the uh, the very famous American writer. Um, apparently, we we visited twice, <laughs> and then we kind of, we close out our our trip with a a visit to the Biltmore Estate, which is just an incredible, obscene um, reminder of what wealth can get you. Um, and the students really, really enjoy uh, that visit because it provides tons of material for their IG pages. So um, I think that's it. It, it, is a, it is a study program, though. So a lot of this, all of those activities include uh, reflective writing, uh, we ask you to engage in this, in these activities from an academic standpoint and a reflective standpoint. The class actually runs over the course of the whole summer two semester. So when you come back, you'll typically have some, some assignments, some writing assignments to work on. Thank you all so much. Hello, I'm Danny. Hi, I'm William. Hello, my name is Julianne. And we are students in the second year, and we want to talk about what our experience was like in Scholars Program A in the second year. So the beginning of our friendship started when we went on the retreat in Seneca Valley, in which is around, I think, 10 minutes from here. And in the beginning, we did not know each other. We came from different schools. We probably were in the same school, but uh, we didn't either talk to each other or we saw each other in the hallway, but we didn't make a connection until we got into the retreat. And as you can see in those photos, we're making um, a tower, I believe, of marshmallows and spaghetti. But here where we learn how to work as a team and um, we share with each other what were some of our fears of being in college, what are we in, what are we not sure about, and we offer to um, support each other by creating a group me and um, talking about our problems and offering advice to each other. So what do we do outside of class? So aside from just doing readings or writing essays, um, we like to hang out wherever we go So and make connections. So in the first photo right there, you can see we just had a Halloween party. This was from last year, actually. And we just wore our costumes and we had a fun time. We watched some TV and we just uh, found time to hang out for the Halloween season. And the second photo is where three of us. Uh, oh, that photo is cropped. We can't see William's face. <laughs> um, that photo is where we were hanging out at the spot, which is around five minutes from here. And we like to hang out and have lunch or have dinner sometimes outside of our normal class schedule. And the last photo right there is where, outside from our schedule museum business to learn about exhibits that relate to some of the lessons that we learn, we like to go, we like to sometimes go out to DC and explore some of the monuments. So we really like to be, we really like to explore um, things that we are unfamiliar with outside of class. So I just wanted to share a little bit about um, Swannanoa and the trip that we take over in the summer. Um, it really is one of the highlights of the entire scholars program, in my opinion. It was where I made a lot of my close friends that I have 
today in the program because um, our first semester here at MC was completely online. So it did take longer for all of us to create those bonds that usually happen like right off the bat. So that this trip really did help us, um, you know, make that friendship that we couldn't do at the beginning. So here is just some photos that we took. Um, the second one is with one of our teachers that we have um, in the Celtic week um, that we spent at the Swannanoa gathering. Um, so I think, yeah, that class was a, was a singing class. Um, um, and his name was um, David Curley. And he was like a very, very, they're all very friendly. And it, they really made us feel very welcome there at the, at the, at the school. Um, in the next, slide I just these are some of the pictures that I took um with some of my friends um the the one on the far right um is another teacher that was also really really friendly that um helped us feel very welcome there at the school um this was us there was the river the Biltmore um it's really very beautiful there in North Carolina it's someplace that I'd never been and it um it was a really, really great experience to go someplace that I don't think I would usually go to. So, um, and also there's the museum and the river, and it was really just a really great experience for us all to get to know each other. Like um, Professor Provost said, there was the, the dorm um, experience that a lot of us have never had because we didn't go to a four-year university. So this trip really does provide us a glimpse of what we, a lot of us will then experience when we transfer to our universities or wherever we do in our future so yeah that was just a little bit of what you might get to experience if you decide to join the program which I really do suggest that you do because it's a it's a really really great experience hi um so as Julian said earlier we did not have the first year experience we were expecting being virtual for the entire first semester so the professors did do a lot to help encourage us to speak out out in class and to try and get to know each other despite not being able to meet in person. And then uh, we also ended up creating a group meet together, which it looks like the uh, first years have followed again this um, time as well to also better get to know each other and schedule meetups outside of class in order to meet with each other in person so we can at least have um, some face-to-face -face contact before, uh, before we began the second semester. And so some of our group messages that included like <laughs> just procrastinating, which d I do not recommend at all. <laughs> and also a lot of um, us just like keeping each other's um, spirits up during the time and posting like videos of music to help us study or just like posting study plans and stuff as well. And so here are some of the memes that we posted in the group chat to lift our spirits. That are relatable. Uh, so one of the biggest events as well with scholars is the winter solstice event, uh, which is when we all get to see each other in person on campus. Uh, we also did say goodbye to Professor Stead, uh this year. Uh, she was a really great professor for us scholars. And then uh, we got to kind of know each other a lot more and also get to meet with some of the alumni and some of the second years and find out what they're doing for their capstone project. And right here, as William said, and I want to emphasize this more, we have the opportunity to bond with each other regardless of our majors. And I really encourage you guys to join the scholars program. And this it's an experience that will change your life and will change how you do the first two years in college. Good morning. I was just remarking to our second year students that it's kind of funny seeing your huge photo up there, um, but I'll, I'll get used to it. Um, my name is Kelly Klein, and I am one of the Montgomery Scholars Program Two counselors. Um, working with the bright and dedicated students and faculty in Montgomery Scholars has truly been the most fun and rewarding experience in my 30 years working in higher education. And so I really hope um, that those of you who are here today, the prospective students, will consider applying to join this very special community. To give you a little bit of background on how um, 
the scholars program and counseling works, as Professor Wang noted, every scholars class is assigned a counselor. I am one of two of those counselors, so I currently work with our first year students and will be staying with them through their graduation in the spring of 2024. Scholars are required to meet with their counselor at least once a semester so that we can do academic transfer and career planning. And this process starts the summer before you start your first year. That's when we really you know, start to get to know one another. Um, and in our meetings, so obviously we'll talk about classes, we'll talk about your academic interests, um, and that's an, also a time where I can let you know about MC resources that might be here to help you. Um, for example, if you're having issues with, you know, time management, we actually have a class that you can take for that. You feel like, hey, I'm coming to college, but I have absolutely no idea what I want to study. Fine. We actually have a career development course that you can take. Um, oh, you know what? I really feel like I would benefit from getting some individual support with my academic goals. Through our Achieving the Promise Academy, we have coaches who will work with you one-on-one. -on -one. So there are lots of resources and support for you during your journey at MC. In addition to those meetings once a semester, your scholars counselor will have weekly office hours that are reserved just for scholars. So these are great opportunities to come check in, just let me know how things are going, um, I've also assisted students with a variety of personal and other challenges during these times. Um, we've had students face food insecurity and we've connected them to resources. I even had a student during the pandemic who was used to studying in the public library and that no longer became an option. So I helped her find a desk so that she could have her own space um, at her home. So we you know, the other duties is assigned. We're definitely, we're definitely into that in helping you in every way possible. So considering whether to come not just to scholars, but also this idea of coming to a community college, um, a lot of students and their families have questions about the next step, you know, transfer. How does all of that work? Rest assured, making sure that all of you end up at an institution that's a good fit for you is a high priority for us. And that process starts again in that meeting where you'll meet with your counselor the summer before you start your freshman year. We will talk about if you if you already have ideas of where you may want to transfer. I remember particularly a student in my first class. I mean, literally, like I had to do nothing for her. She came in and she said, oh, yeah, you know, I've heard about scholars. I know someone who's a scholar. I'm already committed. You know, this is definitely what I want to do. Um, and I'm going to, after scholars, I'm going to go to St. Mary's College of Maryland, where I'm going to double major in physics and education. And then I'm going to, and I'm going to also get my, I'm, so I'm going to get my degree from St. Mary's. And then she was also going to stay at St. Mary's and get her master's degree in education. She did all of those things. She's now an honors history teacher at Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. Um, but don't worry if you said, oh, I'm probably not going to be that student. I don't know what I'm going to want to major in or where I'm going to want to go. That's why we're here. That's why we make the big bucks. We'll definitely help you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, but yes, we'll definitely, you know, help you with that process wherever you are, you know, in your journey. Um, I also wanted to mention that we have a lot of resources available at MC to help you with this process of figuring out how the whole transfer thing works. One of them, for example, is called ARTSIS. So for those of you who are thinking you may want to transfer to a public school in the state of Maryland, with ARTSIS, you can look up course equivalencies. So anything that you take at MC, you can see how is this going to transfer to Towson or UMBC or the University of Maryland or St. Mary's? ARTSIS also has a feature called Recommended Transfer Programs, where you can say, I'm at MC, I'm thinking about being a psychology major at UMBC, and it will show you every class that you can take at MC that will transfer into that major at that institution. So we're going to help you figure all of these things out. Now, even though I feel like I've done a very good job promoting scholars and transfer, 
I'm guessing that some of you might be thinking, you know, this sounds great, Professor Klein, but aren't I going to be at a disadvantage having gone to a community college in terms of getting to the school of my choice down the road? And I would say absolutely not. Professor Wang talked about some of the success of our current uh, Montgomery scholars, and it turns out that often our students are actually better positioned to go to their school of their choice having spent two years as a Montgomery scholar. Think about it. Friends of yours who go on to the four-year institution, great, absolutely nothing wrong with that. They're going to be taking, you know, some gen ed courses. They're going to be taking some courses in their major. You're going to be doing exactly the same thing as a Montgomery scholar, but you're going to be in a small cohort where you're earning almost 30 honors credits, and you will have written a, tw I don't know if we've talked about this yet, but you're going to have written a 20-page research paper in your second year. I've worked in higher education my whole life, and I'm telling you, I don't know of any institution where second-year students are writing a 20-page research paper. This is very impressive. And just to quantify what I'm telling you, we had a student from the class of 2021. Her dream school was Georgetown. She applied as a high school senior, didn't get into Georgetown. It's extremely competitive. It's extremely competitive to get in also as a transfer student, but this student not only got into Georgetown after spending two years as a Montgomery Scholar, she did so with a scholarship. We also have three students from the class of 2022, so the class that just graduated, who earned UMDs, were, were awarded UMD's most prestigious transfer scholarship, the Frederick Douglass Scholarship. It's a full ride, full ride tuition for two years of study at UMD. They only offer 30 of them, and Montgomery Scholars got three of them. And then a final example from the class of 2022. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. Um, they offer scholarships both for incoming first-year students and for transfer students. It's a nationwide scholarship. Students have to show significant financial need. And they also have to be just really incredible students uh, merit-wise. So it's both a merit and need-based scholarship. And we had our first Montgomery Scholars winner in the class of 2022. And this scholarship provides funding up to $55,000 per year to the school of your choice. So it's not, oh, I have to go to UMD. Oh, I have to go to Michigan State. No, wherever you get in, Jack Ken Cook gives you $55,000 per year, and we had a Montgomery Scholar um, in the class of 2022 earn this. So yay, scholars. Scholars will take you anywhere. Now it's my pleasure. So speaking of, you know, um, scholars, alums who've achieved a glory, um, I am thrilled to be able to introduce to you our alumni speaker. I have known Jonathan Jays Green for 12 years because he was in my first Montgomery Scholars class. As a Montgomery Scholar, Jonathan was very active in the successful effort to pass the Maryland Dream Act, and he has spent his entire career since working tirelessly as an advocate and activist for marginalized groups. Um. What else is oh, oh, this is the other thing I was going to say, but I need to look at my notes because it's, it's a little um, long. So if, as I'm sure is the case, you will want to learn more about Jonathan after hearing from them today, uh, go to the Smithsonian Institution, the National Museum of American History, because Jonathan is profiled in an exhibit featuring the history, culture, and political power of Latinos in the United States. Without further ado, please welcome me in joining Jonathan Jays Green. Good morning, everyone. Oh, that was bad. That was weak. I think we can do better. Good morning, everyone. There we go. Uh, I am so honored to be here with you this morning. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's always so good to be home. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time telling you a little bit about my personal story. Uh, my Montgomery, can you hear me okay? Oh, God, I hit the, oh, wow, that is me in a big picture. There we go. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm going to be spending some time telling you a little bit about my personal story, uh, a bit about my Montgomery Scholar story, my journey since being here and graduating from Montgomery College, and some of the lessons that I've learned uh, 10 years out. I can't believe it's been 10 years since I graduated. So my family and I came to the United States from Panama, um, and I think that a lot of my journey in this country has been um, in relationship with the American dream. You know, we've all heard it, the, the, the idea that uh, this is the country of opportunities, that if you just work hard, that anything is possible. And as a young immigrant, as a young, ambitious uh, high school student, I was ready. <laughs> so I worked really hard in high school, graduated at the top of my high school class, uh, really fell in love with the community um, and became so grateful that so many folks were really invested in my success, that I got really involved in the community. I did over a thousand community service learning hours. And at the end of my high school career, um, I started to realize that because of something that I couldn't control, my immigration status, that my path to higher education was going to be harder. Um, I will be really honest that Montgomery College wasn't my first option. It wasn't my second option. It wasn't my third option either, right? Uh, but I applied because one of the counselors in my high school said, hey, I know you're like set for the stars, you're gonna go places, but check out this program. It, it seems to be really special, it has a scholarship. Um, and I'm so grateful that I got in. And even though I got into all the four year schools that I had applied to, almost all of them, because of my status, I couldn't afford to go to any of them. So I came to Montgomery College and I will say that I was really humbled, right? Because I came with a lot of the stereotypes that there are out there about being going to community college, especially as a top honor student. Um, and what I found really surprised me. What I found was an incredible community um, that even though I Montgomery College wasn't my first option, I and every student that walked through its doors were the institution's first option. I found an institution where I could learn and be challenged and take really rigorous academic classes and learn about the world and really learn tangible skills that would follow me all of these years later. So of course I got involved. I started a student club. Um, I was appointed by the governor to serve on the student board of trustees, um, help pass the dream act. I, I was doing it all <laughs> because again, I was just so grateful that this institution and this program in particular saw me, um, saw my potential, and I wanted to give back. And since then, I went on to transfer to Goucher, I majored in sociology, um, and continue my work and my fight for racial and social justice. So starting from working at the governor's office back in 2014, uh, to eventually after the murder of Freddie Gray, being called back to activism, and co-founding an organization called the Undocu Black Network that organizes at the intersection of racial justice and immigration. Um, and back in 2019, I think, being really exhausted and really cognizant of the world uh, that we live in, um, I became really called to protecting our democracy, right? And really thinking about, you know, again, back to this concept of the American dream, I think, while um, at times uh, this country has been hard and has disappointed me, I think one of the lessons that I've learned in Montgomery Scholars is that, um, you know, if we have a vision for this country and this world, that we can work on behalf of that vision. So for me, that has looked like, you know, trying to elect candidates that reflect my views, uh, building organizations that do work uh, that feels close to my heart, and now in philanthropy, uh, really helping move resources uh, to those communities that are most impacted by the issues we're talking about. When I think about how uh, my journey has been impacted by being a Montgomery Scholar just uh, a little uh, 10 years ago, there are three main lessons that I want to share with you. One, I think uh, learning and uh, embracing the intellectual rigor to wrestle with big ideas but also daring to come up with solutions and working on behalf of those solutions. I think it's something that I learned here at Montgomery College. I think the second lesson and second gift that I've taken from this program have been lifelong friends. 
10 years later, some of the closest people in my life, like the people that I call when something goes wrong, are other Montgomery scholars. Uh, even as I moved away, I came back, some of folks have moved to other parts of the country. We still talk on a either weekly or monthly basis. Um, and we really build the really strong bonds that have carried me through all of these years. And I think the third lesson that I want to also share with you has also been really thinking about how the program through the support that it offered me, helped me give me the freedom and support to design the life of my dreams. So for me, that has looked like uh, being an active citizen of my community, being active in, in volunteering and political causes. For me, that's also looked like all the professional achievements from the roles that I've played to now being at the Smithsonian, which by the way, you should check it out. Um, but also most importantly to me, this building of this life of my dream has, has been really dedicating to a life of service. Um, and I want to just leave you as you're thinking about whether or not Montgomery College or Montgomery Scholars is part of your journey. I want to leave you with a poem that has ascended to sacred text in my life. It is a poem by um, a Black woman by the name of Lucille Clifton. And the title of the poem says, Won't You Celebrate With Me? And she says, won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no motto. Born in Babylon, both non-white and women, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between sunshine and clay, my one hand tied to the other. Won't you celebrate with me that every Day, something has tried to kill me and it failed. So as you think about your journey here at Montgomery College, think about this institution and this program as that bridge between starshine and clay that can help you build the life of your dreams. And I hope you consider it. And if you get in, if you're lucky to get in, please take it seriously and take advantage of it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I, I feel very fortunate to work with the students that we work with. Um, you know, it's a cliche where the student, no, the teacher's like, oh, amazing. But, but in this program, I feel it every day working with these students that I'm supremely lucky to be able to work with the students that we have. Um, one word that gets used frequently to describe um, the Montgomery Scholars program is family. Uh, it does feel very much like a family. We, we are a close-knit group. We offer each other support. It's built to have this community aspect to it from the very beginning, and it just keeps going. Uh, I myself went to a, a big state school with 3,000 students, and I, I struggled at first, and being part of this program made me feel like, well, if only I had this kind of support. <laughs> I could do so much better, <laughs> or something to that extent. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, there's a lot of, um, faculty, uh, staff support to, to see our students, um, achieve the best they can achieve. Uh, at this point, I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the application process. There's a deadline and it's January 31st. For our program to apply to Montgomery Scholars, there's a two-step process, um, it's not complicated, it's just the first step is you apply to MC. <laughs> you had to do that to get an ID with MC, okay? Uh, you, know, you, you apply to MC and you become an MC student. You just you know, fill out the forms and you get your MC ID. And with that ID, then you apply for the scholars program. Okay. Uh, and, and that's you know, not a complicated process. You just go to this URL and it'll, it'll walk you through it with your handouts. You also have the application guidelines. On our website, we have our application guidelines. You can download those, those at any time. Uh, but essentially, we ask that you fill out you know, some uh, fields, your name, et cetera. There are some short answer questions for you to complete as well as an essay prompt. And we will need your high school transcript, some letters of recommendation, two required from a teacher, uh, one recommended from a counselor, uh, and we often get asked whether test scores are required. The SAT and ACT test scores are not required. They're recommended. Okay. 
Um, it's good to have them, but you don't have to have them. Primarily, it helps us determine uh, where you place in the English uh, portion. So whether you place it to English 101, English 102, that sort of thing. Uh, but we, it's a process where we look holistically at your entire application, uh, your GPA, the letters, the stuff you've done outside of class, what you say about yourself in the letters recommendation. So, you know, looks looks like a typical college application, I, I suppose. If you do not have SAT or ACT or AP English scores to submit, then we ask that you go through the guided placement process so that we can determine where you would place in English. It's a pretty straightforward application, but if at any point while going through this, you have any questions, feel free to email us. Uh, we're here. You can call us as well. Um, and our website has everything. But, you know, I understand, like, yes, the website has everything. But if you have a question, it's kind of like walking into a store, like, where can I find, you know, the signs are there. But if you don't know, just ask. We're here. We're here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, we'd love to hear from you.